I'm Catherine Lewis from Mills College, and I seem to have lost my name tag somewhere along the way. Um, and I'm going to be chairing this panel, which is advice from K-12 and university, which is great, um, lesson study practitioners. And we had a series, have a series of five questions that we're going to be asking people to respond to. Um, and here are the participants. I'll give you a moment to look at their names. They all up here. Make sure we've got the right right group. We do. Yeah, is Eric? Oh, Eric's at the end. Yeah. Okay, and I'll just ask them to identify themselves before they speak. And particularly since it's right after lunch, I'm going to try. We're going to try and do something fairly interactive, which is. Um, going to reverse this a little bit and so we have these five key questions and I'm going to put up each one and a couple panelists we've talked a little bit ahead of time a couple panelists are going to talk about each question just very briefly and then we'll open it up to further discussion from the floor about that question and um, these are the five questions so get a sense of those because each one will be coming up in in this order and uh, Feel free to expand on each one as it comes up, ask it in a different way. Okay. So let's start with how is lesson study similar to and different from other forms of professional learning you've experienced? My name is Brigitte Lahm. I'm from Sonoma State University. And so I guess the normal form of professional development that I've participated in anyway. You go somewhere, somebody teaches you a topic, you do activities, you participate, you learn something and it, it, it's, it's exciting usually and very interactive and so you learn a lot and then you go back to your teaching and you hope you use some of the activities maybe with your students and but basically you hope that whatever you learned made you a better teacher. With lesson study it's really not so much about how you are teaching what you have learned somewhere and then pass on, but rather you refocus totally on what are the students learning. So what is going on and in the classroom? And you are looking a lot at the evidence of what is going on in the classroom and you really find out if what you're doing is working or not, what the students are learning. So I think that's the biggest difference that I can think of between the traditional type of professional development and the lesson study. The one thing I'd like to say is that I think actually having participated in, in uh, quite a few series of lesson studies myself, I find that I actually learn the most from the lessons that were not successful. The ones where you, you go in and you teach this lesson and then at the end you go like, ah, it was did not, and you look at the evidence and you really try to figure out what happened and what were the students thinking and where can you change this so that you, you know, so that you will be more successful next time and then you do it again and wow, it's so much better but it still isn't perfect and you're still working on it. It's, it's a wonderful process. It really does make you think deeply about how students think and how you can best access that thinking. Plus, I guess you do get the immediate feedback too. Because you're doing the planning, and then you observe, and you teach it, and other people observe what's going on, or you are observing how that lesson is taught, and what the students are learning, and you immediately see, and listen to the students, and observe that they get it or not, and then you tweak the lesson, you do it again, and it's, it's very intense while you're doing it, but it's all right there. It doesn't take like a semester to figure out what actually happened. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Before we open it up to the, oh. Um, just quickly, I added to Brigitte last time is that it's the one time that I'm actually a high school teacher. I'm sorry, my name's Jane Decker Baldwin. I teach at Petaluma High. And when I did this, I, I found that I had colleagues in my classroom, which they come in and out, but they, I had six teachers in my room watching what I did, watching what my kids were learning. And then we actually sat down and talked about it. So it's like probably the closest. I mean, yeah, we go to trainings together, but, and then we go, oh, yeah, that was good. Maybe that wasn't so good. Um, I'm going to try that, but you never really sit down and work really closely 
And it was really nice because I had people from our crosstown high school there too. So we're all in one group instead of like being against each other, we're all on the same side for change. And that was kind of nice. Okay, would anyone from the audience like to um, follow up with a question? Yeah. So you mentioned teaching the lesson and then getting everyone's feedback and tweaking and then reteaching. Is that, where is it that you're typically reteaching it? Like, I mean, what is the setting in which you can teach that a like, second time? Well, so I've participated at lesson studies at my university. We actually did a couple of lesson studies with university faculty in two of our classes. And then I've also been a participant or observer in K-12 lesson study. And so usually you, you have several teachers who are teaching the same class at different times. And so somebody teaches it first and then you debrief and you change the lesson and then somebody else teaches it in their classroom. So talk a little bit, please, about time frame. When you debrief and teach again, are we talking three hours later or are we talking the next week? I think that's what your question is, is the practicality of, of class timing and pacing and how do you not get behind? Eileen Wilson, um, and I'm a 4-5 uh, teacher in Oakland. And um, the most of, most every one of the lesson study groups that I've belong to was able to release the teachers to come to observe the lesson and then the, the debrief was immediately after. So it was within if you taught the lesson in the morning then you'd have lunch and then you'd debrief for the rest of the afternoon and then the next lesson you would take place within the next couple of weeks you know, as soon as you could possibly schedule it. So it's almost always on the same day. It, it, you know, I, I've never had it any other way so but I'm sure there are other models. Well, either you or Jackie mic up. So, you know. <laughs> then we won't have to. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, um, sometimes what we will do is we will. Um, have one release day where we plan to uh, work with our lesson study team all day. And so we will have all our materials ready in the morning. We'll try to schedule, uh, say, you know, say it's a group of second through fourth grade teachers and we've decided that we will teach in third grade for this particular lesson. So we may um, go to a third grade class in the morning. Um, we'll uh, get out of the lesson, we'll do the debrief. We, we will plan ourselves maybe a couple hours into change some things, you know, let's change the worksheet, let's change this, let's change this approach, let's change how we're grouping kids, whatever we're changing. And we will have then scheduled in, and from two to three, we'll go to this person's third grade class. Maybe it's a classroom that's not even of somebody in the lesson study, just another colleague who's agreed to let us in either in that school or another school. And uh, we'll try it again that very same day. Other times, you know, teachers maybe can only have half a release day, and we've met in the afternoon, we've, uh, taught the lesson, debriefed, and the next time we can meet is a month from now. And we just plan to meet um, with a couple hours lead time to the next lesson so that we can remember where we were and how we changed the lesson. And, and so it can go different ways in my experience. So just to try to read into what the two parts of this question is, you know, normally in school we think about there's a certain sequence of when certain things get taught and you teach it and then you, you know, you, you sort of uh, move on through the curriculum and if there's too far apart, what do you do about that? It's sort of, so, uh, and, and you heard a little bit about what different people do, but not all lessons need to be like that. Lots of times uh, getting a lesson that where uh, the topic's already been taught and now you sort of create a lesson to make sure that the kids understand it and understand it in a deep way, especially around a big idea. That, there you have a little bit more freedom of exactly when it gets actually taught. It's not so critical that it gets taught at a certain 
point or that it fits in in this spe specific sequence. So uh, that's sometimes some of the reasons that a certain uh, research topic would be selected. Hi, I'm Stan Patrick from Oakland. So sometimes the the analysis lesson can get spread out over a couple of weeks because um, a lot of times lessons sit as, sit as part of a sequence of lessons and based on the first teaching and analysis, if the revised lesson gets taught in another classroom, to really see if the revision worked, you want to bring the student work together from three or four classrooms down the road. And so the second phase where you're looking at student work that comes out of that revised lesson. So I think you have to have, give some time to get that done and, and taught. So it can be a two-step process, an initial debrief, then a secondary debrief, which looks at all the classrooms together. Okay, I think I will go ahead and move us on to the next question, if that's okay. Um, what have you learned about mathematics and its teaching learning through lesson study? What were the supports and catalysts for this learning? Hi, my name is Jackie Hurd, and I teach uh, in Palo Alto, California. And uh, in thinking about this question, I generated a list of all of the lesson study groups I had done along mathematics over the past 11 years, so I could try to capture all of the things that I've learned, <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> which is impossible. <laughs> but um, uh, the first uh, lesson study lesson that I did was around subtraction with uh, the difficulty second graders have with subtraction with regrouping. Of course, that's where you'd start, such a small thing. Um, and then the next lesson was around problem solving and how do kids attack problems and the next lesson was working with a group of fifth grade teachers on have, helping them understand equivalent fractions. And with these fifth grade teachers, we thought we made the most elegant, beautiful model that if they just used this model, they were really going to get equivalent fractions. So we taught the model, and then we gave them equivalent fraction problems, and nobody used it. So then that led us to a group of coaches to say, well, we need to look more at how kids understand fractions, and so let's go younger and look with third graders and second graders, how do they understand fractions? What models do they naturally create? And this made us interested in proportional reasoning. And so with a group of coaches, we said, well, let's look at this understanding with kids that are a little bit older. So let's look at proportional reasoning in sixth and seventh grade. And that was so interesting that it raised even more questions about fractions. So we went back and looked at proportional reasoning and the relationship with fractions in fourth grade. And then the toolkit came on in proportional reasoning. So we had to look at it again. And then that I changed schools and worked with a team of teachers who wanted to look at multiplication across the grades. And the fifth grade teachers felt like their kids didn't have a robust understanding of multiplication. So let's look at that across the grades and then algebra across the grades, and then finally, how do we use our math curriculum in an effective way? And um, so these are the series of lessons that I've done and to try to capture what mathematics did, did I learn from that. It would be hard to, to synthesize, but what I did learn with every iteration was how much I didn't know I didn't know. So it wasn't until these questions came up and I started to look that I realized, wow, look at this big gap in my knowledge. I need to go and find out more information about this topic. I need to work with people to develop my own information about this topic. So really that was the most revealing thing that I learned and it created a real need for me to go more deeply into my curriculum. It created a need for looking at mathematical research. It created that need for collaborating and talking with other people. Um, the other kind of learning that I think happens in lesson study, so there's that intense content piece, but there's also the research about learning that happens and I think can only uniquely happen when you're in a research lesson watching children learn and when you can have that luxury of just focusing on one student or a small group of students and watching them wrestle with a task and watching you know when the light bulb goes on and what happened to make that happen um, and analyzing what would I do now if I was the teacher and what are all of the different ways kids are going to unpack that task I think there's really um, that's the only place to get that kind of learning of really understanding how students think and how children learn and um, imagining what is the teacher move that would be the most effective here. 
And I think the other kind of learning that happens is um, I become very highly motivated in some research lessons by practices that I saw that really moved kids. And then I thought, I, I need to do that. That needs to become my practice because look how effective that has been. And likewise, I have seen things that I thought, oh, I do that. I shouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> That's not good. Um, so, but it's really seeing that in real time and how kids react that aren't your own students that drives that, that message home. Um, and the last kind of learning that I want to talk about is, um, you know, Deborah Ball said that it's startling that we don't teach teachers how to talk to parents when they spend so much of their time every day having to do that. And it's also dangerous to believe that teachers can be good collaborators unless we give them the tools to do that. So one of the very powerful things that I've learned in lesson study is also how to be a good collaborator and how to make collaboration safe and effective so that people want to keep coming back and doing it over and over again. <coughs> uh, my name is Eric Mall. I'm the uh, district math specialist, uh, kindergarten, seventh grade for Oakland. And uh, I'm new to lesson study this year. And I think what I've noticed more than anything from a district level is for the last few years, we've preached to teachers, um, reteach, reteach, reteach. And what lesson study has allowed teachers to do is understand about re-engagement and, and the differences between reteaching and re-engagement. Um, reteaching is so skill-based and it, it's a demand at the district level um, because of things like the CST. And I've just seen with teachers the understanding now of it's not about just going back and practicing a skill over and over again with students, maybe during problem of the day, but actually the opportunity to say, how am I going to re-engage them around the big idea um, that David was talking about? And so um, I'm seeing a progression where, where there's more getting deeper into the conceptual and away from that skill base that seems to be kind of permeating um, urban districts right now. Um, Eric, could you just give a little um, snippet of what you mean by the difference between reteaching and re-engagement, just in case anyone's not familiar with that term? So in, in typically in reteaching, if we have, I'll, I'll take a grade level, um, we take like um, third grade fractions. And third grade fractions of students, or I'll go third grade expanded form. So if a student can't work with ex taking standard form to, to expanded form, teachers will then have time during the day because the pacing is so fast to develop POD where they practice that maybe a few weeks later. Um, and so they're practicing expanded form, but they're never actually getting into the, the concept of, of place value. And so in, in a re-engagement, I saw, um, they were actually grade one teachers, but I saw them actually sit down and they, they thought about it and they taught it, revised it, and watched each other. And what they ended up doing was they ended up coming with a way to really work on an understanding of tens and ones. And of course, the third grade, we're talking about thousands as well. But having the kids practice, work together, look at what their misconceptions are around uh, bundling and, and the understanding of composing and decomposing numbers uh, by their place value. So getting away from that skill base and moving more towards letting the students work with that, those understandings of the bigger ideas. And Brigitte, did you also want to? So some of the things um, that I've learned from the lesson studies I've done at the university level is we did one lesson study on real analysis, and I'm a little hesitant to call it a lesson study because there was only one section of that class in our program, and so th three teachers were planning it together, but then only one person taught it, and so then we didn't reteach that lesson, obviously. We went on to the next one, and we did it with a series of, of classes. But the person who was actually teaching the class had never done lesson study before, and so what she said was the most beneficial for her, and what she learned um, from the process was just the this in-depth planning of not just what you are doing, but trying to anticipate how the students are going to react, what kind of misconceptions um, to anticipate, um, planning for where they are doing group work on Riemann sums or something like that, and um, what kind of prompts can I give them if they get stuck. So really this very in-depth thinking about and planning of the lesson was totally new to her 
And she was saying that was the biggest benefit for her from the lesson study process. And um, one of the things that we learned or that I learned was we are wrong all the time when we were trying to predict what, an, what impact some of our teacher moves would have on our students. We agonized in one of our lesson studies over giving um, the students manipulatives early on in an activity because we thought it would lead them too much along the way that we wanted them to go and wouldn't give them enough freedom to come up with something. And then we actually, so for years we agonized over this. We never tried it. And so then in the lesson study we actually tried it and no effect whatsoever. I mean, so we hadn't done it because we were afraid of what it would do to the lesson and then we finally did it and we were just so wrong with all the guessing that we had done. But you don't find that out until you really pay attention and have other people in the classroom observing what is going on. Um. I just want to say uh, one thing that lesson study doesn't require reteaching of the lesson. In fact, in Japan, that's pretty rare. Um, it just happens that that's the example that was used in the teaching gap to introduce. So in Japan, it's much more typical for everyone to invest in that study and planning phase and then to teach the lesson, um, carefully study student learning, and that's often the end of the cycle there. So we shouldn't feel if we're not reteaching that it's not lesson study, for sure. Was there someone else who wanted to speak to this issue of what um, what have you learned about mathematics and its teaching and learning through lesson study? Can I say one more thing? Sure. So I don't know if this is exactly about lesson study, but there was this comment earlier about that uh, when mathematicians engage in lesson study well, at the K-12 level that it's not charity. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if, I mean, I haven't learned necessarily from the mathematics in a particular lesson study, but just working with elementary school teachers or in teaching the class for elementary school teachers, I've learned an unbelievable amount of mathematics. I mean, the example earlier today was models for dividing fractions. I had no access to teaching that. The first time I was supposed to, I almost cried when I was preparing the lesson because I didn't know how to do it. And just being engaged and working with teachers and uh, learning about the strategies and really thinking about the different representations that as a mathematician I'd never thought about the different representations of operations of fractions things like that it has really changed my teaching in my other classes as well so it, when I when I teach precalculus or calculus I will not do the same thing that I did before I worked with um, the classes for elementary school teachers now, there, are there folks that want to um, ask uh, questions about this question? Or do any of our colleagues from Sonoma, we have a set of very experienced lesson study practitioners in the back, want to add to this question of what, what you learn about mathematics and its teaching learning from lesson study? Oh, sorry. Do we need a, yeah. Oh, there's one back there. I think what I want to reiterate is how much we keep learning. So we keep pushing deeper and deeper. And so last night on the way home, we spent two hours talking about what is it about lesson study that triggers our adult content knowledge increasing. Um, so I think what I'm trying to say is that the process keeps refining and going deeper and deeper. So after 10 years, we're still learning an awful lot from the process. And that was Joan Easterday from Sonoma County Office of Education, which is another great source of information about uh, lesson study. Right. My name is uh, Dave Chosa. I work up at the Sonoma County Office, too. Uh, one of the things we, on, again, on the way home last night, we were talking about this, and um, we came up with uh, one of the ideas of the fact that we tend to listen so intently to what the students are doing. We, we conduct student interviews, sometimes it's one-on-one, -on -one, asking them about the mathematical task. and just through that process of analyzing what they know and, wh and how they are solving the problem, we oftentimes learn a great deal ourselves about new, different approaches, different uh, ways of thinking. So even just, just the act of listening to students, we learn a lot of mathematics. Mm -hmm. And um, that, it seems to me, hinges on so, or sort of leads naturally to the second part of the question of what were, what are, were the supports and catalysts for the learning that we've experienced in lesson study. You said that careful analysis of student thinking helps you think about the mathematics. 
I'm wondering if anyone wants to add to that. What have you learned about what supports mathematical learning in lesson study and maybe what acts as a barrier? Um, Thing that I think helps is the luxury, if you're not the teacher, but rather an observer in the class, the luxury of just being there and listening and not having the expectation to engage with the students or having to respond to what they're doing, but just being there and watching and really thinking about what you're seeing is, is, is bigger than you, than you can imagine, really. Um, and I'd like to say that uh, for, I think many of you have probably seen the How Many Seats videotape, and Jackie, who was the halftime math coach, halftime elementary teacher at that point, had to say several times to the teachers in the group, shall we try this problem ourselves? And the first time there was no take up of her question. It took a couple suggestions. And then it was finally when the teachers took up the problem and started solving, you know, how, what's the relationship between the number of perimeter units and the number of equilateral triangles. It was at that point that they generated um, very different approaches and a lot of um, sort of lack of clarity, misunderstandings. Um, so I think that was a really rich um, place. And if you hadn't asked a second time, shall we try this ourselves? Do we have enough materials to try it ourselves? That that learning probably would not have happened. I'm wondering if someone from SVMI can also talk about dirty lessons. Because it's such a catchy phrase. There's no substance, it's just catchy phrase. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so I, I think um, I have been in, in uh, lesson study teams where the tendency is to once a research uh, question or questions have been chosen, to try to find that perfect lesson and then just uh, over a course of many meetings, you know, how can we make it perfect before it ever gets to kids? And, you know, time goes by and time goes by and time goes by and you spend all this time trying to make it perfect and then you get to kids and they do whatever they're going to do. And, you know, what you expected to do, them to do and what they do is often very, very different. And so we have evolved um, to this thing we call a dirty lesson where, you know, get it in there quick. It might not be perfect. It might not be what you imagine it could be, but get it in there quickly because what kids do with it will most usefully inform how you want to adapt it and um, enhance it. And, and that usually is the most efficient way to go. So, so I think it, I think this, the dirty lesson or a, a, a lot of this has grown out of, I, I, well, I taught for, I taught classroom, uh, in classroom for 20 years. And uh, when we, when people would talk, they would talk out of opinion, you know, what they believe could be best practice. Uh, what lesson study brings is a place to actually point to real evidence. And so, and the real evidence is what students are making sense of it. So this whole idea that, uh, that in any kind of planning or any research lesson is really based on are kids learning, are they not learning, and, uh, and having the luxury to look at that. So when I think about both the supports and the catalyst, it's really what is coming out of uh, the kids as we, we look at this. And so very much an, uh, an evidence-based 
kind of thinking. Okay. Um, does anyone in the audience want to ask more about that? About this issue of mathematics teaching and learning? Yeah. Do we have a, uh, let's see, is there a mic? Well, we'll give you this one for now. So you can't, can't do it. Do We're it talking it. about these research lessons, right? What is it that the research is then used to inform? Like, are you curriculum designing from it, or are you just, um, or are you communicating with district level or like math coaches, or what is it that, where, are, where does that go? <laughs> I, think it, I think it could be any of those, actually. Uh, but uh, the, the core part is just uh, uh, better instruction. Uh, and, uh, but we have, we've, t uh, we uh, are using uh, lesson study and lesson study format to, uh, to per uh, perfect a new curriculum that is coming out, the ones that I sort of talked about maybe the last time from the Gates Foundation, what they're supporting some uh, curriculum development, we're using lesson study techniques uh, and a lesson study process to actually improve the curriculum itself uh, uh, regarding uh, in, in the development of those materials. And uh, this idea of we thought about how can we improve the formative assessment cycle. So we worked on this notion of re-engagement. Uh, that was, uh, uh, so there are purposes uh, in addition to becoming uh, better uh, uh, teachers and understanding how kids learn better, which is the primary focus. And can I piggyback on that a little bit? Um, we do, um, when I did, I guess I don't look at it from a district point of view on what they're doing. I'm just looking at, at how can I be a better teacher and what am I going to do to fix that and my colleagues are in that same boat with me. So like um, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews with students. And I have a student that was getting all A's, and I could have swore he understood the idea that the slope was you count up and over, but he never was. When I interviewed him and I was watching him graph, he was actually plugging in the number one. He plugged zero into the formula, plot the point. Then he'd plug one and he'd do the math in his head and plot another point, and then he'd plug in two. So he was making a T table in his head. And then I started looking at myself and said, okay, how did I miss that he didn't get that? Do you know what I mean? And so now I had to go back and change maybe my thinking or what I'm doing or, you know, that's maybe just one in particular student. Everybody else got it. But it's something now that I'm more aware of that I'm going to go, okay, maybe I need to reevaluate. You know what I mean? So I'm looking at it more on just a personal person kind of thing. Yeah. I'll go ahead and bellow out. Okay. Uh, speak for what's happening in Sonoma County, um, the North Bay, North Bay Math Project uh, is starting a lesson study library. And so right now we have, so Patrick Callahan and Josh and Dave and Tony back there, they can talk, tell you about, a lot more about it. But basically, um, it's a website where, a portal where um, all the, te the different lesson study groups are uploading the materials, their discussions, um, PowerPoint presentations of share cases about their lesson studies. And next Saturday, actually, we'll have a share case of all the lesson studies that are currently going on up in Sonoma County. So if anybody's in Santa Rosa next Saturday, you're welcome to come and uh, watch some of those. They are not public public, but all the teachers in our current grant, which is like 120 or something like that, have access to everybody else's lesson study that's going on right now. So you can see examples of lesson plans, examples of um, the research that's been done, um, um, concept maps, interviews, student interviews that were done in preparation of the lesson that 
was being taught, so there's a lot of material that's being kind of collected in this lesson study library. I'm, I'm happy to show anybody who wants to see it. So I think in Japan, the ultimate repository for what's learned in lesson study is the textbooks. They come to reflect what's learned in lesson study. So for example, um, m there was a lot of lesson study long time ago, from what I'm told, about what are the understandings of multiplication that underlie proportional reasoning. So rather than just how many groups with how many in each group, could we get an expansion notion of multiplication? You know, it takes two meters of ribbon to make a corsage. How many meters does it take to make three corsages? Could we get that expansion no notion of multiplication rather than how many in each of how many groups early on in the curriculum so that that would lay a foundation for proportional reasoning and for, with a continuous quantity? And then that came to be reflected in textbooks. So I think that's really the place where we should ultimately hope this is. And um, I think it's really important to be accumulating not just lesson plans, but also what teachers have learned from these lesson plans and the general strategies that go across lessons. So there are a lot of different kinds of learning. And some of the kinds of learning um, are not at all captured, it seems to me, in the lesson plans. There are things like, how do you create a group where you really challenge people, but they want to come back for more. I mean, that kind of lesson, that kind of knowledge we haven't captured. So at the same time as getting these lesson plans that capture the lesson plans, ancillary knowledge like um, re-engagement strategies, we also want to be mindful of the fact that there's a lot of knowledge that's built up in lesson study that is not captured in those repositories. I'd like to second that too. I, we we haven't systematically tried to collect lessons or lesson plans, and actually, in a way, I think I I, I re we resisted that because the process is so much more than the product. But what it has translated to, and where you can witness a lot, is in uh, developments of uh, tools, videos, uh, uh, the analysis that we have done. Um, uh, I think uh, there, in a little while I'm going to be talking about a website called Inside Mathematics and uh, there are a couple of lessons on there that were actually uh, lesson study lessons but every single one of those lessons is uh, approached from, uh, from observing a public lesson lesson study model and we actually call them public lessons on, the, on those videos so um, I think it's more so what I'm trying to say is that how we work has been so informed by this lesson study process that, um, that all the products that we sort of generate have, have this flavor from lesson study. Did you want to say something, Tracy? It would be dangerous to believe then that these will the best lessons on that topic that, as David said, it, can, it can't capture all that's happened in the process. You know, the product can't really reflect the learning that happened. And um, one of my fears about, I, I, I'm excited to hear that these repositories are, are being created, but I think when people go and look at them, they have to have the vision that, you know, I want to go and see what some people did and maybe they make a good jumping off point for like a new lesson study team to take on that topic. But this is somebody's learning along the journey and not necessary. This is the lesson now to teach area of an irregular polygon or something. You know, not to think that we're now putting those out there as the best lessons. So that's Anybody one thing to be cautious. Yeah. It doesn't just have the lesson plans up there. It shows the entire journey. I mean, from the planning through the lessons, the interviews, the and then the reflection on what was learned and everything. So yeah, it would be done for you know for promotion to promote lesson
Any other questions? Yeah. Other comments from the audience about this? Yeah. So what was the motivation for the um, portal that you're talking about not being public public, but only being accessible to? Don't me, you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, OK, you take it. Teachers um, have really wanted to be able to hear the So we're experimenting with a portal. Um, teachers, our teachers in our area, really wanted to share what they've done with each other. And so we're playing with what that looks like. So for example, Dave was in a lesson study several years ago. Um, and four groups, different groups now, have picked up that lesson and retaught it and revised it. And so we're trying to figure out what that looks like. We're trying to figure out what's important to share with someone about a lesson. So like you've all said, it, it's not the lesson itself, it's the thinking about the lesson and what you learned through it. And how do we even learn how to articulate that um, are really big questions that we're, we're wrestling with. So it, we're glad to share it. Um, it's still in a very rough form. We're just trying to learn how to communicate about it. Are there other questions on that topic? <coughs> other comments? Maybe we'll move on to the next question. What advice do you have for mathematicians and mathematics educators interested in initiating or participating in lesson study work? OK, and I don't think I properly introduced myself now that we're three quarters of the way through. I'm Tracy Sola, and I am the um, SEMI lesson study coordinator. I'm also a middle school math teacher and mathematics coach in Belmont. California. Um, so around um, several different things, first that idea of just getting started and putting together a team and who would be on your team and how would you form a team. Um, so my first, um, which, which was echoed um, by my colleague here, is uh, participation really needs to be voluntary. You know, it's, it's a very uh, risk-taking thing to be on a team because you're opening yourself up to observation by your colleagues and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, you know it, it's a vulnerable thing. So participation needs to be voluntary. And um, if you are in a position of thinking about who you might ask to be on a team, I would suggest uh, perhaps starting with people who you think may be willing um, to look at themselves and be willing to change. You know, people who may be a little more open-minded to, uh, you know, if something comes up and, and they, they having to confront things in their own teaching that they don't like, that they're willing to take a look at that and say, wow, I could be different instead of, you know, having the opposite reaction. Um, I, I would, um, and then in terms of getting together in your group and, and working together, on, uh, you know, on a regular basis, um, I would suggest, um, within your group creating some community norms that will guide your work every day and pulling those up at the beginning of each meeting because um, again this is such a, a vul can be such a vulnerable process it's very nice to have a, a set of norms 
to guide your group. And I also really like the idea of um, rotating roles in your group so that there's no hierarchy because that really leads to uh, a trust and a, a real team feeling, you know. Uh, the facilitator might sit out next time or then they'd be the recorder, then they'd be the, uh, you know, the note taker or the typer upper or whatever, you know, all of those things. Um, it, it's nice to rotate roles. Um, then um, in choosing a research question, um, I think it's really nice if the research question it, um, can be generated from within your group, although you talked earlier about, you know, maybe there's that district thing that you take and run with it in your very own way, so that's nice too. Um, and I, I would like to um, suggest that you may, you may have a research question that is um, centered on a curricular issue, but it's also nice um, to add a, an affective question, you know, about how kids work together or how kids are feeling about this. It's, and be, you know, uh, two things can be investigated at once and it's really interesting to look at the affective piece in student learning. Um, at, uh, we touched a little bit on uh, lesson planning before, but um, and, and uh, um, Aki Murata talked about this in the earlier panel, um, trying to design a lesson from scratch over who knows what period of time is incredibly time consuming when there are already so many great lessons out there. So if you've got uh, you know, a research question in mind, um, go find a lesson that already exists and you know get it out there and then just go from there and and uh, you know i i just really like using the time that i have on our teams to be in with kids as much as possible because that's where the greatest learning occurs and so spending four meetings designing the lesson when you could have been four times in with kids uh, it, it's so much more powerful to be in with kids um and then just during the observation process when you're observing kids really really keeping the focus on what the students are doing. And it, it is a great temptation, I think, of all of us to really focus on uh, what could the teacher have done differently during that lesson and, and really trying to stay away from that to what did we see the kids doing and what could we do different to change their experience next time. Anybody else? Is somebody else speaking to this yeah, point? I just, so, so, um, I've had some experiences about being what they, I forgot what it's called, but sort of an outside consultant to a lesson study team. Knowledgeable other. Knowledgeable other. Well, I don't know how knowledgeable, but <laughs> at least an other. And, and um, I think it's a really interesting role to play, but a very cautionary role. Um, what, so if I was a mathematician or a math educator who's, who volunteered to be a resource for somebody in the group, I would definitely uh, be more about listening and less about telling, uh, more, uh, more about having them uh, uh, be uh, you know, pointed to resources or to uh, just help facilitate looking at the evidence that they've collected through dairy lessons and, and, and about. I think it's a really powerful role to play. I think it's an important role to play, but it, I, I would just say you should be cautionary to be more of a listener and a reflector, I guess. Anybody else? Do you want to say something, Elizabeth? No. Um, one of the things I want to say is I've seen mathematics education, university-based folks make really powerful con uh, contributions by sharing research that had, for example, a set of um, clinical interviews that showed how children misunderstood slope. And that created a really nice set of um, issues for the research, the, for the lesson study team to look at in their research um, lesson. And so often those little, you know, those pieces of research that may not be in the curriculum can provide really interesting, you know, illuminating windows onto student thinking. Because often people have done research on student thinking, and so it's so much easier to see something if you know what you're looking for. And so that can be one very enriching way. And I remember interviewing Jackie at one point, and you saying that you were working on fractions, and David asked you a question about how you were thinking about fractions that 
completely opened up your process? Was that he asked you what interpretation of fractions? Are you thinking about fractions as I, I can't remember the exact context, yeah. Yes, and I remember Jackie um, talking to an outside specialist who kept wanting to tell her group how to, exactly how to teach something. She finally, sort of in exasperation, said, don't you have an inquiry question you're interested in answering? <laughs> and that was a good way to, I think, reframe the process for that. Yeah. OK, you have questions from the audience about this? Yeah. Where are the mics? Can someone hand a mic to this gentleman? Yeah, here, I'll, I'll, I'll okay. Great. So this conversation was actually going to a place I was really interested. I'm Bob Meganson. I'm at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm, my training is very much as a pure mathematician, though um, I've become involved in, specifically in the education of, of underrepresented minorities, and particularly uh, American Indians, because it happens to be my own background. Um, I have, so I'm sure that many of you have had the same sort of experience. I have colleagues at the University of Michigan who I'm sure are meaning very well who had the same sort of original background I had as a, someone who's trained in pure mathematician. They want to save the world. Uh, they weighed out with exactly the attitude that we just heard described here, that they are going to be a repository of knowledge that's going to fix the problems that they see maybe that their kids have with the schools. So if you, if you have somebody who sort of fits that category, this person that comes like up to me and says, I want to work on an Indian reservation during my sabbatical, and I'm just going to fix all the problems with math education there. Um, we have a well-meaning person who may be able to make a contribution, but with this activity or with my activities on the reservation, this is not where they ought to start. I think they need to learn something else first, maybe at the university. And do you have any suggestions about what that might be? to get them oriented in their own thinking in a direction that could be more fruitful for participation in this. I, uh, <clears throat> I, so it's a great question. And, um, but I, I think, I think what, uh, if we're going to get people like, uh, involved, what they have to come and find out what they don't know already, what they have to learn. And basically, when we do our lesson study, and sometimes you have to facilitate this with a more heavier hand than you would like, but you know, we, uh, one of the things that makes the lesson study work is some protocols that everybody in the group follows. And I think it's very, very important that uh, people who haven't worked in schools but have uh, things to offer get into classrooms and really, really watch the kids and having to do a summary uh, in the post-discussion about what they saw, not what they thought they saw, not what they would like to see, not what the teacher should have done, but what the kids actually did. And once we start looking through the lens of what first of all, what can kids do and make sense of, and uh, where were the where were the little speed bumps along the way? Where did they struggle? How they interacted? What they tried to do? Anything unique? You know, every single time, and I get to do this quite often, 
I go and I watch a group of kids, one group of kids, maybe two to four, and at the very beginning, I'll make an assumption that either these kids are, they got this nailed, they're going to do it great, they'll have a, uh, you know, this is, lesson is way below, or these kids are really going to struggle and they're never going to get, and I'll tell you, I bet 99% of the time I'm surprised, somewhere in the middle of that, and I think uh, the, the luxury of uh, lesson study is that you actually get to watch kids learn. Something you can't do when you teach, it only happens when you have this luxury to observe. So, so I would echo that, but also add that if a university scholar wants to come in, they should familiarize themselves with the tools the teachers have. What are the, what, what's in the textbooks, where they might be thin, where they're strong, um, how to help teachers make sense of some of those issues. I think understanding the tools is really important because you can't come in with and say, you do this, and there's no tools to use. Well done, Jackie. You need a microphone for that one. Tad Watanabe, in the book, answers the question, uh, how can knowledgeable others or content experts work with lesson study teams? And the point that he makes is that, you know, good c content experts are like really good teachers. They spend a lot of time, as David said, listening and finding out where those teachers are at and what do they know and what do they need. And then they just move them this much more. They don't say, oh, wow, this is where they are. This is where they should be. I better start up here and work down. They say, this is what's going on. You know, really survey the situation, understand what they know and what they need, and then just go to the next, to the next place. But it takes a lot of, of listening first. And Ted Watanabe is at uh, Kennesaw State University, and he has a wonderful blog. And he's also very um, open to talking about, he is often called in as an um, outside commentator. And a great tribute to him is that I've been listening to tapes from lesson study groups as part of this randomized control trial, some of which worked with him like eight years ago. And they're still talking about some of the mathematical ideas he raised. So you really can have immortal life as a mathematician by <laughs> working with lesson study groups. Tad Watanabe, W-A-T-A-N-A-B-E. Yeah. Right. And he's got a little piece in our yes. yeah, handbook. And in Japan, the way people learn to be a good um, sort of mathematical consultant or outside commentator is they'll go with their professors, you know, when they're graduate students or when they're young faculty. They'll go with um, seasoned professors who do this, who are really good at it, and they'll kind of imbibe it by, you know, being part of the culture. And the senior professor will let them begin to make comments and give them feedback on, well, you know, you should have pushed a little bit more on this mathematics, or you were a little too hard on them. I don't know if they're going to want to keep doing this, or, you know, so they get a good guidance on that. Okay. We got other people that want to talk about this issue of <coughs> advice to mathematicians or mathematics educators who are bringing beginning lesson study. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to say uh, one thing I think, and that is um, because I'm going to have to go quickly because we are. I'm graduating some folks today, um, but what I had to say at the end. Um, on um, how should educate, educators' mathematical misunderstandings be handled. I think that you know, if a, if a math, um, ex, mathematician wants to join a group, if they can embrace some of these ideas, then I think, and really you know, own them. <laughs> and it's hard to do when you, you know, you're so deep in your own content. But you know, coming to the place that you're going to be learning something and you're, you're a colleague with somebody, you know, it takes practice if you're not used to it. And I think that's really the, the most important message that you can give to them, because why are they really doing this? It's, they have good intentions. But we all have good intentions. And the whole point is to get smarter about learning and teaching mathematics. And if that's their, if they can own that, I think the rest will follow. And I just can't, I shouldn't talk so much, but I can't resist 
making a connection between the point Elizabeth just made that treating high school or elementary school mathematics teachers as colleagues, making a connection back to the Sybilla Beckman's vision of one community of mathematics teachers because we are all dependent on what happens at the other levels. I mean, we truly are colleagues and we can either choose to act like colleagues or not. Okay, so I'm going to skip back to that. Um, okay, so the next question is what tools and resources are useful for mathematics lesson study? What kinds of mathematical resources tend not to be useful? <laughs> you want the mic for this? <laughs> so, Jane, do you want to start? Oh. Oh. I just, um, when I thought that, I thought, okay, what did I need? Um, and physically, I needed a camera to video my kids as a tool. I meant you have to video. I meant a lot of our evidence collecting is videotaping kids and what they know one-on-one -on -one, in a group. Um, and then, of course, I needed a computer to be able to edit that. And I have to have that knowledge, which I usually yell at my husband, can you fix this? <laughs> um, and then... Let me see, what else did we need? We need um, the training. Um, we did a week-long thing in the summer about, you know, lesson study, what is it, how do you do it. Um, it it kind of set those norms and those protocols about how to behave, um, how to interview kids, because that's kind of a little nerve-wracking. I can stand in front of a br bunch of kids, but to interview a student and not teach them at the same time I'm interviewing them, that was something I had to practice. I went home and practiced on my own children were in seventh and eighth grade and just that okay well what do you know about that can you give me more about you know instead of saying okay here just do it this way um, so that was a skill that I working on and what else did other things that I needed um, it helps to have uh, banks of questions that help in our particular case we used a lot of Mars tasks from the noise I think they come from noise don't they yeah from the noise foundation we just went online and pulled out Mars tasks that were um, complementary to our, where we were in the lessons and in the book. So that was kind of nice. So again, we're not reinventing or trying to come up with something. Um, we did, but we merged the two things together to help us um, with those open-ended questions and time, lots of time. It takes That's a huge commitment of time to participate and do it and do it right. Yeah, Jane was talking about the the um, training we did over the summer, one aspect of that was practicing to look at evidence and not to evaluate a teacher. So we, we watched video and we were really pushing, the facilitators were really pushing the teachers not to evaluate the teachers, but to look at the evidence of student learning. And we did that over and over again and really just training yourself to look at the evidence and really look at what, teach, what student learning is occurring and how um, that takes practice. So that very, was very helpful to do that. Well, I would just like, I, I agree with everything that everyone said. And uh, the, in terms of the practice, I, I have to say that scoring tests, <laughs> once you score, you know, 300, tests of Mars questions and boy you really get to see what the teachers have been teaching and how students have learned it. It's a really, so if, if you have the luxury of being able to score a lot of tests, go do it. And when you say score tests, you're talking about the Mars assessment? I'm the Mars assessment. Okay, because that's a test where you really get a chance student to thinking. see student thinking. Yeah. Um, so, um, I've, I've made a list of a bunch of tools that <laughs> I think are useful. Um, so, um, you know, uh, David talked about uh, protocols for, uh, for, you know, during your meetings and, and during um, actually observing lessons. And I think those are really important. And again, you can find them in this fabulous book. Um, one thing they do is they really assure that everybody has a little bit of equal airtime, and so people who might not be the people who 
first jump into a conversation, you actually get the benefit of what they observed and, and you know, and then the people like me who tend to just talk right away have to be held back a little bit and not dominate airtime and, and that's really good too. And so that you get the benefit of everybody's ideas there. Those are I extremely important. Um, now, I, I, I think that we've got some different models that we're discussing here and, and um, our, our friends at, uh, up in Sonoma are interviewing kids and, and and I've never done that as part of lesson study, but we have observed, you know, had, had a, a, instead of maybe a gr large group of teachers observing, uh, um, silently observing while the lesson's being taught. And, and maybe you guys are doing that too. Okay, yeah. okay so, so both. Um, but um, so the other thing that's really helpful, um, almost essential going in, is um, who's it, whomever's classroom you are going into, whether it's a, a teacher on the team or somebody outside, is to have them make up a seating chart ahead of time with all the kids' names on it. So if I go in and somebody's teaching and I am standing next to this table of four kids, I know what their names are. And when I'm making my notes, I can just say, you know, Andrew and then whatever Andrew said or whatever Sophia did. And then, um, and then the second part is um, having something on which uh, student work would be recorded and brought back, or if it's video or whatever student artifact you have for in-depth analysis later on. And then you can go back and you've got your notes and you can look for Sophia's work and you can look for Sophia and Andrew's work and you pull it over and you know, you notice them doing very specific things that, um, and Jack, you talked about this, you know, that you have the luxury of actually not teaching and observing these kids, and so then you can share with the group. When they got there, I wa they had this conversation. It was really interesting, and then this is what they wrote down, and so you get such an in-depth knowledge of what they were doing at the time by being able to uh, reference their names and put their work together with it, so that's really helpful. Um, and then, um, as far as the lessons that you choose as a tool, um, open-ended lessons that have um, multiple solution paths uh, and, and a lot of opportunity for students to record their work so that you actually get something back to analyze is really helpful. Um, and also lessons that encourage um, that have a place where you, you can, uh, that students can record their own behavior sometimes. If that's one of the things you're looking at, if one of your affective pieces is, you know, um, how did students work in a group, maybe you have a place on your recording sheet where kids can reflect on how it went for them in the group so you actually know how they felt about it and you're not trying to guess later on. Um, and this sounds incredibly obvious, but um, sometimes, you come back from a lesson and you realize that um, you had all these things you talked about that you wanted to research and there was your research question and your lesson went on and on and you didn't really have down a place for students to record everything about the research question. So make sure things are lining up. And um, I think, wait a minute, I have one more. There it is. And then, oh, what's not useful? <laughs> So um, community norms that aren't created by the group, I think, are not useful because um, I, I don't think uh, that people really spawn, respond to those kinds of things that they haven't created as, as well as when they create their own. Um, less, lessons that require a very low level of reasoning or you just might get back a, a binary answer, yes or no, that's not going to tell you much about what students are doing. Um, materials that distract and over-scaffolded student feedback products. And I have a great example of this. Um, I was in a kindergarten um, lesson study team oh, about eight years ago, and we were studying um, what kids would do with a growing pattern. And it was this little um, um, insect that grew a segment of his body every year uh, that after it was born, but they, it started with its head. And we thought, okay, how are students going to access this? And so we came up with this great idea, and there were little squares that they would glue on for every year of the little bug's body. And it became one giant arts and crafts lesson. And managing materials was so distracting to the students and us that we had no idea what the kids knew about the growing pattern, because it was all about dealing with the materials. 
And so um, <laughs> that was a great lesson for us. <laughs> so finally, we've evolved to a place in that lesson. It's like, wow, why don't we just give them a blank piece of paper and have them draw it? And we finally got down to what kids understood and didn't understand because that lesson was not all messed up with all that stuff. <laughs> and so, you know, at that, that was a, a big they lesson. Kicked you out of kindergarten. Yeah, the, yeah, then they sent me to uh, eighth grade. <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> yeah. I just want to uh, re reiterate what, what a lot of people said. I think video to me was, um, for the teachers that I work with, was uh, probably the most valuable because they were new to the process as well. So, have that opportunity to come back and see the DVD take a look at some of the things that students were saying as is walking around with the camera and just you know collecting their those students thoughts for them to see later um, was beneficial to them but I also look at it as, um, time as a resource we have PLCs professional learning communities in Oakland so the teachers get a lot of time to work together in teams but and we also Marlene mentioned earlier we have a sub release as well if you don't have those things in place, um, finding that time so that teachers can plan together, spend that time to debrief, um, and it's, it's extremely val uh, valuable. So time to me is probably the resource that is most necessary for teachers, especially when you get down to elementary and you're talking about teachers who are working more than one subject area. So just giving them that time. Use the mic so it'll be recorded. Thanks. Turn it on if it's not, or put it near your mouth. Yeah. Sorry. I, I think it, it, it depends on the site. Uh, it depends on the administrator that, that you'd be working with as far as discussing. But I, I would definitely talk to the administrator at that school site and see if there's a way to find some time with, with those teachers. Um, Usually, usually working with them on suggesting, could it be lunch? Could it be some time where there's, um, a lot of times what we do is we may have, um, we do have teachers on special assignment, but you might have APs or something like that who could just take the classroom um, for an hour, the classroom of one of the teachers so that they can actually go into the other classroom. Um, so just working with administrators on finding time. And that's the best way I've seen is, can you just take the room for an hour so I can sit with that teacher or, or take that teacher into another room on their prep. And maybe during that prep time, the three of us can, can have that time together to collaborate. I'll just say another way we found that time was by taking time that was already set aside. Like so in two staff meetings a month, we said could one just be business and one you'll give us the rest of the information in email and we can use that for our lesson study time. We convinced the district to let us use our our uh, professional learning days, you know, three days during the year, can we use those for lesson study? We promise that it'll be about the topics you want us to look at. So looking for time that's already set up there, but saying, oh, that's now going to be our lesson study time. Did you already know what lesson study was and what you were getting into when you were negotiating that? Or did you go in sort of, we want to At do that point, thing? yes, I did. Yeah. So, um, one more thing that I would suggest strongly is that if you're going to go try to negotiate this, go in with data ahead of time. Go in with something that shows that lesson study in other districts and other schools has increased student achievement, has increased teacher uh, understandings and student understandings. So if you have some data, if you even just you know looking at the books and looking at the some of the research that's on already, that's going to give you some some purchase to say. We need this time. It's going to help us. So, I'll just add what Jackie said. I, th I think lesson study requires, if it's to be embedded in the school, it requires, requires a reallocation of resources. It has to be, time has to be set aside to do lesson study and not something else. And pencils and have to buy into it. I think Eric's right. People will do it in certain ways because they're dedicated to it, but it can't be a program you do at lunchtime. It can't be a program you do on the fly. It has to be valued enough so it becomes the PD pro process that people can use. 
And for a lot of, for a lot of places, it presents dilemmas because schools who are like in Oakland, where they're under pressure to get CST scores up, they have to be convinced, and I think Marlene's right, the lesson study was a vehicle to help them do those things. So that was kind of evidence, but that kind of reallocation resources is really an argument to make. And I think that's, that's, the, that's the challenge. Yeah, and I think that often it has to be an incremental change where initially it may be that neither the educators who are about to do it or the administration really understands what it is or what the power is. So you may not be willing to give up much time initially, but as it builds, you know, you can build it more into the structure, get rid of other things because people will see that it's valuable. So often the solution you come up with in the first year is not the same solution you're going to have in the third year. It's, at least that's my perception of how. Yeah, um, I, well, I, I can talk a little bit about that. In the, in the early years that I started this, um, I was in an elementary school and um, there was just a group of uh, grade level, a grade level group that was interested because um, uh, um, some people in the school had done it, but it was just a small project, but then the grade level group really wanted to do it. And so they used their grade level planning time to do it and they were just a small subset within the school. But uh, then that was so interesting, and as we shared at staff meetings, then kind of caught on in the next year. Um, other people tried it during the grade level time. But then the next year, then the school made a little room for it because the momentum grew from below and organically. And, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it implies a faith in teachers. And in these days when there's so much teacher bashing going on, um, I think lesson study is, stands in, as a place to go, no, no, teachers are professionals, and that that's where real learning in classrooms could take place. And so for administrators to make those changes, they have to have faith in their, in their staffs, and I think it's built incrementally, but I think it has to, that, that's an important part of this. It's really key. Exactly. Okay, any more questions on that one? We'll move on to the last question here. Oh, there's a, in case you didn't, and we have flyers for the book. <laughs> that was in the tools question. And um, this is follow-up information. If anyone wants, come up afterwards, and I'll give you um, from, it, do you pronounce it Brigitta? Yes. Brigitta? From Brigitta websites. We heard about the, some of the wonderful work going on in so Sonoma, so you can come up with your thumb drives, and I'll give you this. Okay, final, um, final question, and it is, should also be up on the MSRI website. I sent them this. I sent David Alkley this. Um, how should educators' mathematical misunderstandings be handled? Um, Big question. I'll take that one. Um, I think for all good teachers and all good mathematicians that are here, it's really an obvious way. Um, but that, it, as I said before, it's an opportunity for all of us as a community to get smarter about teaching and learning mathematics. Um, what's helpful is when you support and scaffold teachers in their thinking and reasoning, um, pressing the group for justifications, explanations, and meaning through questions, comments, and feedback. Uh, Jackie did that beautifully, beautiful example of that in seats. Um, I think seats, when you ask, can, does it work all the time, or can we? I think that's what you said. Will it always be true? Will it always be true? Um, the lesson planning and studying you know, curriculum that's rich uh, with a high level of cognitive demand provides a way for teachers to monitor their own learning. And teachers want to monitor their own learning. They want to get smarter about these things. Uh, this is valued by teachers. And it's especially valued when there's um, a way for other people to validate it, their colleagues or a coach um, or a mathematician. Um, acknowledge the number of ways a problem can be solved. Uh, many of us grew up um, being fast and quick and algorithmically bound, and uh, we've we lost the capacity to be creative around mathematics because it wasn't encouraged, and, um, and that's a, a really valuable thing that can happen and should happen. Provide access for a range of ways to enter or to think about a problem, uh, drawing, formulas, sketching, graphing, Lots of times, again, we think of there's just only one way to solve it. Um, so we're only thinking about one ways. Oftentimes, we see kids actually coming up with multiple ways of solving it. Again, we saw that on seats, um, um, multiple ways they were counting. And that opens up a whole new thing for us. But you know, just in a higher level, um, that can be really useful too. And draw on conceptual connections that link to prior learning and subsequent learning. 
I think um, one of the things for me that's what was really helpful as facilitating a group is re uh, reminding people of what they said before. I know that um, in the groups I worked with with you, uh -huh. that re reminding Alex of something that she thought of before that linked to a much later part of the lesson. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a really important point. But at the time she said it, I think she just felt it, it wasn't that strong. But having someone who can be a repository for that, and as you grow in your learning group, I think you will do that. So I think misunderstandings can be handled that way. And, um, and they're the place where we learn the most and making sure that people understand that's the point. The whole point is to be learning. Jay, or somebody else. Well, I, just, I just want to build on that a tiny bit, and that is that you, as sometimes you can really see a teacher's misunderstanding or conceptual mis misunderstanding through the student's work. You know, after they've done the lesson, and then you are, as you are examining the student evidence, I mean, I th you know, you don't have to, you're not there to point out that the misconception came from the teacher, but it's, you know, it ends up being uh, something that we all end up discussing. How is this, how did this come about? Where, to, where, where can we fix this? Move it around so, so the teacher's not, you know, put on the spot, like, ah, I did it wrong, but rather, ah, this is how the students are getting it. Which, how can we get it so that they really get it? I, that, I don't, I'm not sure that was very articulate. <laughs> wow. It's a big question, isn't it? Um, it's teaching high school, I don't think, sometimes looking back, I wonder if my colleagues, and I'm not trying don't see the importance in math. I mean, we all see that you got to read. We've got a gazillion ways to make kids read because everybody societally thinks it's you got to know how to read, which you do, don't get me wrong. But if there's not enough time for math, they kind of just let it go because I don't know if they understand the connections that it makes all the way through. Um, my example in here is I became a much better algebra teacher after I taught calculus because I could see where it was going. And um, I don't know if sometimes people don't see where something's going. And, um, you know, like, I, I would like to go back to that idea of community where I would be able to go into an elementary school and maybe help some of those people. And then they can help the ones below them. And I've already asked Brigitte a couple things that I'm teaching in Algebra 2. I'm like, what do you think? Should I do it this way? And she's like, you know, what? I, I don't know. But, you know, it's kind of glad that I'm, she said I don't know because then I'm not, afraid to ask, you know, oh, there's someone that's a mathematician, pure mathematician. And she's like, you know, I'm going to have to think about that. And, you know, and that I'm, what I don't know, it's okay to not know. Um, and not, I don't want to ever feel like I would have to go into an elementary class and they think, oh, she just thinks she knows. I mean, I'd like to open that door to get people to communicate further down because I don't know if they realize, like, I've actually had students lose college admission because they couldn't pass Algebra 2. Now, did their third grade teacher think that that might be important later? No, because that was in third grade. You weren't thinking math down the line. I mean, I've literally, in the last few years, have had kids that could not pass it. And so um, one lost an admission to UC San Luis Obispo, another one to UC Santa Barbara, and another one lost a scholarship. So um, that that it needs to go through the framework and that takes community which I think Sibylla was saying is we need to get this community going about how important it is and the concepts and not shortcuts but concepts don't do that butter thing fly thing with fractions because I don't know how to do it anyways but um, that's a shortcut out but they need to kind of understand what they're doing does that make sense I'm not the most articulate either a math person um, are there people who want to talk about this, either our colleagues from Sonoma or others who want to ask further questions about this, about handling educators' misunderstandings, mathematical misunderstandings? Yeah. I suppose you could, you could, you could yeah. work with educators yeah. not the oh. same way uh, all fellow, it's okay, you guys can hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I'm worried about the recording. recording. Yeah. yeah, it's here. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, uh, what I tend to reiterate with my students on a regular basis is, is it's okay to make mistakes because that's where we learn. That's where we're learning. 
And, you know, uh, it's kind of the same idea with educators is, you know, we're, we're all going to make mistakes and let's figure out, you know, what happened and, you know, what's the next steps to, to figuring out how to do it. So, you know, same things we do with, 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 uh, with, uh, with our students, uh, you know, we, we do with, uh, with our colleagues. Okay. Yeah. Can uh, you pass the mic back over there? Uh, yeah. There we go. Hi. I had a question that was probably better situated earlier, but it fits in here too. And that is, I was looking for some more examples of uh, how uh, mathematical content comes through in the lesson study process, and. But it also fits here because a related question is, to what extent does mathematical content come through from uh, your, your grade level colleagues working in the, uh, uh, in the lesson study versus those mathematical others uh, who, who are present to, to help along as their uh, bumps in the road? So if you could comment on uh, more examples of, of how mathematical content is absorbed through the lesson study process. I'd appreciate that. I don't know if this is going to answer your question, but one example, we currently have a project, Project LEAD, where we are doing professional development, like intense content work, and then also lesson study parallel. And what has happened is that Kathy Morris and I are teaching the content and we did an activity on the number line where we really explored fractions on the number line and I think so we spent an hour two hours or something exploring this topic with the teachers and some of the groups I think used that activity in their lesson study so they used the same activity um, that they had explored in our workshop and now I brought it down to their classroom. Mm -hmm. So um, we we were working uh, <clears throat> yeah, with high school teachers on one of these new uh, lessons uh, from the Shell Center, uh, exploring um, uh, real numbers, rational versus irrational numbers, and um, so there was this very interesting exchange amongst students uh, that actually got surfaced. So I'll get into sort of the dialogue that went on with these students to, to surface this I, uh, idea. So um, this one, so there's sort of this math, uh, there's, these, there's uh, these rational and irrational numbers written on cards and they're supposed to sort them into whether they're rational and irrational and explain why. So this group of students are working and this one student says, oh, look at this fraction, 22 sevenths. Well, that has to be irrational, that's pi. You know, and then the other, the other student says, no, 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 that's not pi, that's an approximation of pi. Uh, just enter it into your calculator. So they enter it into the calculator, and it comes 3.14, and the digits keep going. Unfortunately, there's a rounding error. So the pattern repeats, but of course it's rounded up. And as soon as it's rounded up, they had just explored another one where the pattern, and now they're totally convinced that 22 sevenths is irrational because uh, the, uh, the pattern doesn't repeat. Well, anyway, that was all captured in this dialogue that occurred among students. And the debrief was a really, really powerful uh, discussion amongst the high school math teachers who have really sort of taken these in sort of a cursory way in the past. And there was really some really deep insights that, that are both around, you know, the content knowledge and the pedagogical content knowledge about trying to surface those. So that's just one instance. And it's sort of like from the mouth of the babes idea. So a normal process for us, too, uh, when we're doing mathematics or any other content is we start with a question of burning need and then we usually go and we look at the curriculum and then we look at 
um, everybody comes to the meeting and they bring something that they think is gonna that they want to share with everybody either it's a favorite popular book you know about how to teach mathematics it's a research article it's you know somebody else's lesson something people bring in you know we go out and kind of cull for things that we think will help move our content knowledge farther and we'll look at those materials and you know, pick a couple to read and have a discussion around, and then maybe based on something that we'll read, we say, oh, well, we need to ask, you know, the middle school teachers about this, or let's email David, or, you know, we need to know a little bit more. Then we go in and we do the lesson, and as David said, the student thinking, the student, what students do is going to raise all new questions for us. So if you look in the book, you'll see that we, when we um, have a list of what's going to happen across a year, we built in, like at our school-wide lesson study, we built in January. This meeting is for going back and reading more information, more content, and having a discussion about that to, you know, kind of refuel, you know, re-knowledge yourself, build your knowledge for going forward. So we kind of say, in the beginning, we're going to go into the content. We're going to do a dirty lesson. We're going to go back to the content, try to get more content knowledge, keep going. And then we usually end up at the end, all right, now we know we, what, what other things do we need. You know? So it's always leaving you with wanting to go back and read that again, or now we need that other article. So I think the summary of maybe all the people's comments is that that content should be built in each phase of lesson study. And if it's not being built, you ought to look at the process and figure out how it can be engineered better. So it should be built when you're studying the materials. Initially, you should be studying rich mat materials. When you're planning, again, you should be solving the problem that kids will solve, generating different solution methods. That should be generating more knowledge. Watching the kids should be generating more knowledge, and then sharing the different things you observe from the kids. So all of those are points that can and should be places where mathematical knowledge is built. And our time is up, but um, these are a few websites that may be um, of interest that people on the panel supplied to me. They're probably not the only ones, but um, they should be on the uh, MSRI uh, website, too. So is that it? So thank you very much for your questions. Yeah.